following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Siegfried is the third opera in this series by Richard Wagner. And in this third part, we penetrate even deeper into profound initiatic mysteries whose true meaning and true content had never before been publicly revealed. And in this story of Siegfried, we see symbolized aspects of the cosmic drama that any initiate from any time or place has to live within their own consciousness. This cosmic drama is universal. It has always existed, and it will always exist. Very few have seen the cosmic drama for what it is, because very few have lived it. When we penetrate into this story of Siegfried, we're entering into a symbolic representation of levels of the path that are rarely tread. In the former opera related to the Valkyries, called Das Valkyr, we heard the story of Sigmund and Sieglinde. And in the last portion of that opera, this divine couple is headed up the path, up a mountain. And this mountain is symbolic. When we study initiation, when we study the complete path, what we're studying is a great work of conscious development. And this work is symbolized by a mountain in many esoteric traditions. And throughout the history of this race, we've seen the mountain as a symbol of initiatic development In the Bible, when Moses ascends the mountain, in the Greek mysteries, we find Mount Olympus, we find Kailash, Mount Meru, and other symbolic mountains in the Eastern traditions, Hinduism and Buddhism. And in every case, This mountain is a symbol. 
Of course, most people who study religion and study mysticism take these symbols literally, as if there's literally a mountain somewhere, physically. But we state, to make it clear, that these mountains are symbolic. So the mountain that the couple is ascending in the second opera of this series represents the first mountain of three mountains. Now, in most traditions, we only hear of one mountain. And that's because in most traditions, we're only hearing about the first stages of the path of initiation. The later stages, having rarely been walked, have never been revealed until very recently. So the first mountain is the mountain of initiation. And it's on this path, this work of inner development, which is accessed through the sexual cooperation between a man and a woman, or in other words, through tantrism, is a sacred path that many initiates walk. In many traditions, we find the necessary steps. We find the necessary symbols, even if they aren't explicit. Alchemy, tantrism, that. These sciences contain the essential keys symbolized in their depths, which represent the process whereby one is born again. And of course, to be born, we know, is a sexual problem. When Nicodemus told Jesus, he didn't understand the mysteries. Jesus explained to him that it's one thing to be born of the flesh and another thing to be born of the spirit. This birth of the spirit is what's accomplished in the very first few portions of the path of the first mountain, the mountain of initiation. And this first portion is symbolized by seven serpents of fire. And if you analyze Buddhism or Hinduism, you'll find the symbol of the seven serpents very common. But this is also symbolized in other ways. These seven serpents are seven individual works within which, within which the initiate has to raise the fire of the Holy Spirit within himself, in the same way that Moses raises the serpent upon the staff in uh, the wilderness. This process of being born again is gradual and it is accomplished by passing ordeals, by passing tests, by gathering within oneself the necessary elements through scientific chastity, working in cooperation with a spouse. And in that process, the, the second birth is gradually accomplished so that as a result, the soul is born. And this is symbolized in the first, in the, the last act of uh, the second opera about the Valkyrie. When Sigmund and Sieglinde are ascending the mountain and Sieglinde is pregnant, she has within her a child ready to be born. And this is that soul that will be born as a result of these works ascending the mountain. That child is named Siegfried. In Kabbalah, we understand that Siegfried is a symbol of the human soul. Tiferet. Willpower. Which, if you examine the tree of life, is directly in the center of the tree. Related to the heart. And Tiferet is the warrior. The fighter 
In the Arthurian mysteries, he is Lancelot. Now, if you remember from the previous opera, there is an obstacle, and Sigmund cannot ascend without. That is, he cannot go to Valhall, to heaven, with his wife. Brunhild offers to save him from Wotan, from his own responsibilities, from his karma. But Sigmund refuses to go to Valhall. He says, if my wife cannot come, if my love cannot come, I will not go. And so, in the next moment, he enters into battle with Hunding, and Wotan appears and breaks the sword of Sigmund. And Sigmund is killed by Hunding. Hunding, of course, represents our own ego. What we find symbolized here is a profound initiatic mystery related with the fifth serpent of fire, which is naturally related with the fifth sphere of the tree of life, counting upwards from the bottom, Tiferet. When an initiate someone who's accomplishing levels of initiation, has reached the fifth initiation of fire related to Tiferet. Near the end of that process of raising that particular serpent on the staff, that initiate is given a choice between two directions of their continued development. The choice is the same one that Sigmund faced to ascend to Valhall, to Nirvana, to heaven, or to remain with his love, with his spouse. What's symbolized there is the choice between choosing the direct path, staying because of love, staying in the wilderness, because of love. Or entering Valhall and receiving protection. Escaping the battle. Abandoning one's duty. In some sense. Because Sigmund, of course, in refusing to enter into Nirvana, to Valhall, does so because of love. And really, the direct path is the path of love. It is the path of the Bodhisattva. We call it the path of love because only the initiate who chooses to take this direct path incarnates love. And who is love but Christ? Christ, the Christos, is that universal energy which is descending from above and illuminating the entire tree. Christ is not an individual. Christ is a force. Christ is love. But that love is, is exemplified in sacrifice. Selflessness. The Christ does not have an I. The Christ is not individual. Within Christ, we are all one. Within Christ, all the masters, all the angels, all the prophets are one. In the world of Chokmah, which is related to the Christ, to the Son, it is a world of unity, of oneness. And that energy, that expression, is an expression of selfless love. At this moment, the initiate who's reached this degree of development has to choose between incarnating that love, giving birth to that in themselves, 
or protecting themselves, holding on to their own self-identity and being saved and taken to Valhalla. In Buddhism, the ones who choose to take the spiral path, the easier way to go to Valhalla, are called Pratyekas or Pratyeka Buddhas. And this term refers to a kind of selfishness or self-love, a kind of sense of self, being identified with oneself, considering oneself to be real to have an eye. And typically this this, uh, idea of the Pratyeka Buddha is related with the Hinayana teachings or the lesser vehicle, which seeks enlightenment for one's own sake, which seeks liberation from suffering, but with only the driving concern for oneself. You also hear this type of practitioner or this type of initiate called a nirvani. Or in some mysteries, they're called the selfish gods, the jealous gods. And truly, if you look at the Hindu, or I'm sorry, the Buddhist wheel of samsara, you see that on the wheel itself are heavens in the upper portion of that wheel. And those heavens are part of the wheel of suffering. And that's where the jealous gods live. They are gods. They have powers. They are initiates. But they are attached. Attached to power. Attached to their initiations. Attached to their sense of self to being a so-called master. And so they reign in certain levels of heaven and have powers and abilities. But they are suffering. Not in the way we do, but they still suffer. But of course in the opera, Sigmund renounces Valhalla. He refuses the protection of Brunhild and chooses to stay with his love, with his wife, with his spouse. This is a sacrifice of love. And this is the only way through which an initiate enters into the direct path, by renouncing nirvana, renouncing powers. But what happens to him? He dies. Of course, that death is symbolic. The symbolic of the death of the eye the death of self-love. And it's related to initiatic mystical death. That death is necessary in order for Siegfried, the human soul, to fully develop himself. But of course, he does so in darkness and in obscurity. So now let's listen to the first act of Siegfried, so we can advance in our understanding of this profound opera. Siegfried, Act 1. Mime, Albrecht's brother, is forging a blade in his cave within the forest. The Nibelung dwarf is plotting to obtain the ring for himself, having raised Siegfried Siegfried to kill Fafner for him. He needs a sword for Siegfried to use, but the youth has broken every blade he has made. Siegfried returns from his wanderings in the forest, demanding to know his parentage and Mime is forced to explain how he took in Siegfried's mother, Seglinde, who died giving birth. He shows Siegfried the shard of nothing, and Siegfried orders him to reforge the sword. Siegfried departs, 
leaving Mime in despair. It is beyond his skill to repair nothing. An old man, Wotan in disguise, abruptly appears at his door. The wanderer wages his head on answering any three riddles from Mime, and Mime agrees in order to dispose of his unwelcome guest. He asks the wanderer to name the races that live beneath the ground, on the surface, and in the skies. These are the Nibelung, the giants, and the gods, as the wanderer correctly answers. Now Mime is forced to wager his own head upon answering the wanderer's riddles. The wanderer asks him to name the race, the race most beloved of Wotan, but most harshly treated. The name of the blade that can destroy Fafnir, and the person who can make the blade. Mime gives the answer to the first two riddles, the Walthungs and nothing. However, he is unable to answer the last riddle. Wotan spares Mime, telling him that only he who does not know fear can reforge nothing, and leaves Mime's head forfeit to that person. Siegfried returns and is annoyed by Mime's lack of progress. Mime realizes that the one thing he has not taught, taught Siegfried is fear. Siegfried is eager to learn it, and Mime promises to teach him by bringing him to Fafnir, the dragon. Since Mime was unable to forge nothing, Siegfried decides to do it himself. He succeeds by shredding the metal, melting it. And casting it anew. In the meantime, Mime, realizing that by the terms of his agreement with the Wanderer, his head is now forfeit to Siegfried. He brews a poison drink to offer Siegfried after the youth has defeated the dragon. When this act begins, we observe Mime. Mime, of course, is a Nibelung. Or, in other words, a dwarf, a dweller of the underworld. Mime is a blacksmith, he works in the forge. By the twists of fate, Siegfried is raised by Mime. But Siegfried does not know his own identity, nor his parents, nor his history. He only knows Mime. Now, Siegfried has innocence in his character and courage because he doesn't know fear. But he is easily, uh, what is the word? Mime doesn't tell him everything. Mime is very crafty. Mime knows certain things, but doesn't reveal them. Being a, being a blacksmith... Mime represents how our own ego, our own mind, has the capability to create. It has the capability to use fire, to use energy, in order to create elements, to create things in the forge. Symbolically, we know in Gnosis that the forge is always related to sexual power. It's in the forge of the alchemist where the weapons are created, where Vulcan from the Greek mysteries, the Roman mysteries, forges the weapons to give to the warriors. But Mime is not Vulcan. Mime is a Nibelung. He is consumed with envy. 
He's a schemer. He's a liar. He's a thief. He is our own mind. But in particular, he is the mind of the initiate. Siegfried is born in an initiate. Someone who's already surpassed the fifth initiation of fire. Someone who has already entered into the direct path. In other words, someone who has renounced nirvana. Now, it's good to point out here that you cannot renounce something that you do not have. If you don't have money, how can you renounce it? If you don't have nirvana, how can you renounce it? Renunciation is only possible for the one who has something to renounce. There are many in the world who now proclaim themselves to be bodhisattvas and who aspire to enter the path of the bodhisattva. And this is wonderful. This is beautiful aspiration to have. But it's one thing to aspire towards being a bodhisattva and another thing to actually enter that path. This is a conscious experience. This is something related to the soul, not related to belief or intention. The one who renounces nirvana knows nirvana, experiences nirvana, has the power to consciously go in and out of nirvana at will. Someone who's acquired this fifth initiation of fire has developed in themselves the kundalini, the fire of the Holy Spirit, related to the physical, ethereal, astral, mental, and causal bodies. In other words, they have created the soul. They have created the solar astral body, which gives them the capacity to travel at will in the astral world, consciously, out of the physical body. This person has created the solar mental body, which gives them the capacity to travel at will in the mental world, to visit temples, to speak directly with the gods. And they've created the solar causal body, which is the body of willpower, conscious will, which gives the initiate the capacity to travel in the sixth dimension, free of ego, in absolute ecstasy of the soul. You have to acquire that before you can renounce it. This is the symbol of Siegfried. Siegfried is the result of that renunciation. The initiate who renounces nirvana and chooses to take the direct path takes the path of the revolution. Very few initiates have taken this path because it's so revolutionary. It's very difficult. The vast majority of spiritual teachings only teach the most kindergarten level of spiritual studies. Most spiritual schools have no clue about what real initiation is because most of the religions and schools that exist in this day and age have come from the previous Piscean era. and so have very little or no knowledge of real initiation of these first few steps, much less the many steps that follow. And part of the reason for that is that most people who do manage to enter into initiation and who do manage to reach the fifth initiation of fire after years of struggle choose to take the easier way choose to take the spiral path 
to hold on to the powers they've developed, to maintain their clairvoyance, to keep their ability to travel consciously in the other worlds, to keep their disciples, to be admired, to be respected, to be worshipped. And thus, they only have knowledge up to that level. And therefore, that's all they teach, is the level of knowledge up to that point. Those who have entered into the direct path are rebels, revolutionaries, very strong characters like Jesus. Jesus was, was entirely revolutionary in his entire way of being. He's not the type of person that you see depicted in modern Christianity who's weak. Jesus was a man of tremendous strength, a very powerful personality, but a solar personality, a very powerful person like Buddha who also is often depicted as weak, as very passive. But neither of these masters is, was ever passive, and neither one is passive now. They're very revolutionary figures with a very forceful, very strong, very direct teaching, which has been misinterpreted and disfigured by man. Moses was a revolutionary who entered into the direct path. Elias, Elijah, all of these prophets are prophets of the direct path. And when you study their teachings, you see the intensity and the ferocity of what they teach. And mankind does not like that. But the ones who especially don't like it are their nirvanis, the Pratyeka Buddhas. It seems odd to us, that the gods fight amongst themselves. But they do. And this is symbolized, of course, in these operas, in the Mahabharata, in the Greek mysteries, in the Nordic mysteries. All of the ancient mythologies represent the gods in conflict. Only the Christian one, which, of course, has been hacked to pieces doesn't demonstrate this. But all the other mythologies do. The Nirvanis, the Pratyeka Buddhas, those who are attached to their positions and power, to being respected, abhor the Bodhisattvas. Reject the Bodhisattvas. Criticize. Scandalize the bodhisattvas. And this has always been the case and continues to be so to this day. What's important for us to grasp is that the one who enters into the bodhisattva path, the direct path, basically starts over because that person renounces all of their powers out of love for humanity. They renounce all of their abilities. They, announce, they renounce all of their internal conscious development for love of humanity. And so they become like Siegfried, with a strong personality, but with no real weapons, no real force, innocent, and in the company of their own ego who in this opera is symbolized as Mime. Now, Mime, of course, has the pieces of the shattered sword which belonged to Siegfried's father. And that sword, of course, is called Notung, which means nothing. And this is symbolic of the Kundalini. In the course of this first act, Siegfried enters to find Mime forging a sword for Siegfried. When Siegfried comes in, he brings with him a bear. And in a very teasing way, 
has the bear threaten Mimi to attack Mimi? And Mimi, of course, is terrified. That bear symbolizes the strength of the earth, the forces of nature, which Siegfried commands. What's interesting here is that Siegfried represents the human soul, this new birth, like Jesus born in the manger, a child born into a place of dampness and darkness, like the cave of Mime, or the manger of Jesus. But that child still has power, being a developed consciousness. And that power is symbolized in the bear, sexual power which Siegfried controls. And he uses that force to threaten Nime, to threaten his own ego, to say, I'm the one who's really in charge here. You, Mime, might think you're in charge, but you're not. Mime is terrified because he knows the bear can consume him. But Siegfried calls off the bear and tests out the new sword that Mime has given him. But of course it breaks. This sword is the weapon, a tool, which the ego offers to the initiate. All of us have to learn to discriminate. To know how to manage the capabilities of our own mind. There are many capabilities that our own mind, our own heart, has. Our own mind, our intellect, our heart can produce marvelous works, ideas and theories and concepts, practices, ways of understanding, ways of relating. But they are not sufficient for the work that Siegfried has to accomplish. Siegfried needs weapons that are greater than that which the mind can provide. Of course, in Gnosticism we study that in order to conquer the mind, we need something that's greater than the mind. Mind cannot conquer itself. We can think about things all we want. We can theorize about spirituality. We can read books. We can build a very beautiful intellectual concept about what the nature of God is. What is the nature of self-realization? What is the nature of realization, of liberation? All of these mental concepts and beliefs in the heart and practices that we perform may be fine at certain levels of development, but Siegfried cannot use them. To advance in the path of initiation, Siegfried needs a power greater than the mind. He needs notong. He needs the power of the nothingness. He needs the kundalini. When the sword was broken, it was broken because Sigmund, Siegfried's father, renounced nirvana, rejected the entrance into heaven, and chose to take the direct path. Wotan then came and broke his sword. In other words, he broke his powers. He broke his ability to fight. This is related, of course, to the serpents of the Kundalini of the first five initiations. Now in Siegfried, Siegfried needs a sword, but all he has are the shards, the broken pieces. And those shards are those five bodies, those five serpents of fire. But they need to be reforged. They need to be put back into the flame and made strong to fight in a new level. Now, there are actually seven serpents of fire. But the, first, the top two, number six and seven, never fell. These two are Brunhild and Wotan. The one who takes the direct path enters into a new octave. New stages, new levels. In which that initiate or Siegfried, in other words, has to retemper the sword to make the sword anew.
But of course, at first he asks Mime to do it. Siegfried asks Mime, take the shards of that sword and forge it for me. Of course, Mime knows he can't do it. At the same time, Siegfried tells Mime, you are not my father. We look nothing alike. This is a very important point as well in this act. Siegfried, of course, is symbolizing our own human soul. Our own consciousness in terms of willpower. In other words, abstract mind, intuitive mind. Mime, naturally, is representing the ego that we have, but the ego that we've grown up in. Siegfried, of course, is raised in Mime's cave. Mime is always telling him, I'm your father and your mother. I'm all you know. I've done everything for you. I've protected you. I've fed you. I've taught you everything you know. You owe everything to me, says our own mind. This is the, a combination, really, of our personality and our own ego, our own sense of self. We have to develop the capacity to discriminate, just like Siegfried does, to learn to see the difference between our true self, our true self nature, and our inherited ego, our inherited personality, our acquired characteristics, which are all false. You see, Siegfried is given into the hands of Mime to be raised there. And this is Jesus being born in the manger amongst the animals. But Jesus didn't make the mistake to believe that that was his real home, that that was his true identity. Neither does Siegfried we have to acquire that same discrimination. The path of the revolutionary, this direct path, is a path within which one renounces even one's own self. All the concepts we have of self. Truly, when you come to know yourself, to have true self-knowledge, you come to understand that you are not what you perceive yourself to be. Each one of us has existed in a body previous to this one. We just forgot. And we claim, well, I can't remember. We can't remember even what happened last week or last month or last year. How are you going to remember what happened in your last body? You can develop that memory. You can develop that capacity through meditation through transmutation, by developing the powers of Siegfried, the ability to discriminate, to see. The self that we have now is false. It is acquired. It's acquired because of the nature of our own hypnosis, the way our mind is attached to matter and to sensation and becomes hypnotized by craving and aversion. Siegfried commands Mime to reforge the sword for him, and Siegfried runs into the forest. And at this moment, Wotan appears. And Wotan, of course, we've discussed, is symbolic of our own inner father, our own inner spirit. Wotan is called the Wanderer, He's like the spirit that moves over the face of the waters. Kabbalistically, Wotan is both Keter, or the first arcanum, the magician. He's also Chesed, the seventh arcanum, the warrior, the fighter, and the chariot. He's also the fourth arcanum, the emperor. He is that wanderer. He's our own spirit who illuminates many aspects of the tree and appears with many faces in the course of the development of the initiate. 
he appears in this scene to speak with Mime. And he says that he'll challenge Mime to a battle of wits. And they exchange questions. Of course, Mime bails. What's curious in this scene is we see how our own ego believes it can outsmart God. And this is really a theme throughout the entire series of operas. You see with Albrecht, with Fafner, and with Mime, this continual sense that they have, a belief that they have, that they can outwit the gods. And at times it appears that they do so. So here we have Mime believing that he can outwit everyone. And our own mind believes that. Our own mind forgets that every action bears a consequence. Our own mind causes us to lose sight of the truth of karma. That every man will reap what he sows. And so our mind whispers in our ear and tells us, you can do it. No one will ever find out. Forgetting, of course, that the one who manages karma is God, is our own being. So this is the case with Mime and Wotan. Wotan naturally traps Mime and says, since uh, you failed to answer my questions, I now have your head. But I transfer that right to the one who forges the sword and kills the dragon. And Wotan leaves. Of course, we know that that one will be Siegfried. When Siegfried returns from the forest, he finds Mime dejected. Hasn't reforged the sword for him. No tongue. So Siegfried does it himself. This is again symbolic of how our own ego cannot awaken our consciousness. No belief can awaken us. No theory can awaken our consciousness. Membership in any school cannot awaken our consciousness. Being close to any so-called master, having a certain collection of books, knowing a certain collection of practices, believing this or that. None of that will actually awaken the consciousness. None of that can forge the sword that we need to fight against ourselves. The only one that can awaken us is ourselves. Even the Buddha stated that. I cannot save anyone. Each of you has to work out realization for himself. Now in the Christic mysteries, in the Christian mysteries, symbolized a little bit differently. We know that the only one that can save us is Christ. But that Christ is not individual. That Christ is energy. It is love. And in order for Christ to save us, he has to be born in our heart. He has to be born in our mind. He has to live in our actions. And that is only accomplished when we are present, when we're paying attention, when we're conquering and controlling our own ego, our own desires, our aggression, our lust, our envy. That is all Mime. That is all Albrecht. That is all Fafner. These things have to be controlled like an animal, in order for us to awaken and to do the will of God, to do what is right. So Siegfried arrives and begins to forge the sword himself. This is related to the second half of the first mountain. The first half, we know, was related to serpents of fire. But then when the initiate chooses the direct path, the sword is broken, and the initiate has to begin again to forge the sword anew. 
The sword, of course, is the kundalini. It's the force of the Holy Spirit that rises in our spinal column and forms a sword of will, willpower, that we can use to conquer our own inner dragon. So that process of working in the forge, working in the fires of the Holy Spirit, is a process of raising seven serpents of light. In other words, completing the second half of that first mountain. And this is a process of initiation, which is gradual and very difficult. Each serpent is a process of being tested, of being put into the flames, put into the fire, and hammered by the blacksmith. That blacksmith is the Christ who's born in the heart of the initiate, who's born in the heart of that bodhisattva, who strikes against the mind of the initiate repeatedly with the hammer of karma to teach the initiate, to form the blade to make it strong. The heat of the forge is the heat of ordeals, the heat of desire, the heat of passion, the heat of anger, of envy, which the initiate has to withstand in order to forge the sword anew. And throughout the process in the opera, Siegfried is singing very happily, very beautifully, because for him, this is his perfection. This is how he acquires his weapon. This is how the Christ develops into a superman. In the first stage of this first mountain, when the soul is first born, really what's happening there is that man is born. We call someone a man because they have acquired manas. Man comes from manas, which means mind in Sanskrit. And manas is related with tiferet. In Sanskrit, we know there's this trimurti or trinity, atman manas, which is related to the structure of our own soul. Manas is mind, but abstract mind, intuitive mind, mind that doesn't use thought, but it knows. This is the kind of mind that meditation develops. We also have inferior manas, which is netzach, which is related to the mental body. But superior manas is here in Tiferet, related to the willpower, to our conscious willpower. Manas, man, human. Hu is, of course, spirit. Allahu, from Islam. Who is God, is spirit. So the human is spirit controlling mind. Human. Human. Being. Our own being is Wotan, our inner Buddha. A human being, a real human being, is someone who can be, to have the presence of God within them. The spirit who controlling the mind, manas. So none of us are real human beings yet. We are human beings in development. Embryos of human beings. Really, we're just animals that have intellect because we are controlled by our desires, manipulated by our passions, by our impulses, by our instinct, by envy, by fear. We cannot control our fear. We cannot control our lust. We cannot control our pride. We act humble. We act peaceful. We act serene. But it's fake. In other words, we are all sanctimonious. We act like we have sanctity, purity, moral purity, but we don't. We put on that face like the Pharisees and the scribes. In those first initiations of fire, The man is developed. Any Buddha is a man. Any Buddha has developed manas. But very few of them become 
a superman, something beyond the man, something beyond a Buddha. And this is Christ. The superman, the supernal man, is born when one enters into the direct path and the Christ is born in our heart and mind. This is the arrival of the superman. Do you know where this term came from? From Nietzsche. Did you know that Nietzsche was a friend of Wagner? That Nietzsche and Wagner were in the same group of people. Isn't it interesting that Nietzsche wrote his book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, all about the terrors and the wonders of the superman. In other words, the Christified initiate. While Wagner was writing his ring cycle, all about the superman. And Parsifal, which is also about the superman. The superman is the Christic initiate, the Christified initiate, who develops these serpents of light. Only the direct path can lead one to those initiations. Pratyeka Buddhas, Shravakas, all the Nirvani Buddhas, the jealous gods, cannot receive those initiations. None of them incarnate the Christ. None. They talk about Christ. They might worship Christ, but they do not incarnate him. This is the forging of Notung for the second time. It is the process of completing that first mountain. And when Siegfried completes it, in the process of completing it, Mime is all the while plotting how to get Siegfried to use the sword for his benefit, to benefit Mime. And then in the end, Mime is planning to kill Siegfried. This is how our own mind acts like our best friend. That voice you hear in your head is the voice of your own ego, who's always telling you what to do, what to think, what to feel, how to act, all the while as if it's really you, as if that's your real identity. But behind that, in secret, that mind is plotting your downfall. And that's why increasingly, through time, and from lifetime to lifetime, and from body to body, suffering increases because our karma gets heavier, because we continue feeding desire, continue feeding mime, continue being misled by desire, by passion, by hate, by envy. Now, when Siegfried completes the sword, he splits the anvil to test it. Now, the anvil is obviously a symbol of the tool you use in the forge. And the forge is a symbol of Tantra. It's the place where all the heat and pressure are gathered. Tantrism is the science to harness energy. The term Tantra means continuum or flow. It relates to energy. And if you've studied true Tantrism, not the Tantrism that people in the West think of now, which is all black, which is all wrong, but real Tantrism is the science to harness forces which reside within us. The Dalai Lama stated very clearly, the purpose of Tantrism is to harness the subtle energies of the body in order to awaken the consciousness. And that's symbolized by the forge. When Siegfried is working in the forge, he's working in Tantrism, in alchemy, in sexual, scientific chastity. When the sword is finished, he's finished that work and he splits the anvil with it, which represents a period of abstinence, 
a period within which he takes a break from the forge, takes a rest. And this happens at different moments through the path of initiation. But in this moment, Siegfried is prepared to go and fight the dragon. So he commands Mimi, take me to the dragon. And we enter into the second act. Act 2. The wanderer, Wotan in disguise, arrives at the entrance to Fafner's cave, where Albrecht is keeping a vigil. The old enemies quickly recognize each other. Albrecht blusters, boasting of his plans for ruling the world once the ring is returned to him. Wotan calmly states that he does not intend to obtain the ring. To Albrecht's surprise, Wotan wakes Fafner and informs the dragon that a hero is coming to fight him. Fafner dismisses the threat, refuses to surrender the ring to Albrecht, and returns to sleep. Both Wotan and Albrecht depart. At daybreak, Siegfried and Mime arrive. Mime decides to draw back while Siegfried confronts the dragon. As Siegfried waits for the dragon to appear, he notices a wood bird in a tree. Befriending it, he attempts to mimic the bird's song using a reed pipe, but is unsuccessful. He then plays a tune on his horn, which brings Fafner out of his cave. After a short exchange, they fight, and Siegfried stabs Fafner in the heart with nothing. In his last moments, Fafner learns Siegfried's name, and tells him to beware of treachery. When Siegfried draws his sword from the corpse, his hands are burned by the dragon's blood, and he instinctively puts them to his mouth. On tasting the blood, he finds that he can understand the woodbird's woodbird's song. Following its instructions, he takes the ring and the tarnhelm from Fafner's hoard. Mime reappears, and Siegfried complains that he has still not learned the meaning of fear. Mime offers him the poison drink. However, the dragon's blood allows Siegfried to read Mime's treacherous thoughts, and he slays the Nibelung. The woodbird now sings of a woman sleeping on a rock surrounded by magic fire. Siegfried, wondering if he can learn fear from this woman, heads towards the mountain. In all the ancient mysteries and great religions, we have consistent symbols. In Christianity, we can see quite easily that there are three Traitors. Three intelligences who betray the Christ. We see Pilate. We see Caiaphas. And we see Judas. And each of these three traitors plays a role in the cosmic drama related to the initiatic process of Jesus. And of course, Jesus was just living that universal cosmic drama in order to teach it to us. For us to understand how we have to, in turn, face our own three traitors and how to do it. This opera is doing the same. This opera by Wagner presents three traitors to us. We see Mime, Albrecht, and Fafner. Mime and Albrecht are brothers. They are both Nibelungen, dwellers of the underworld. 
Fafner, in this opera, is a, is a dragon, but he was a giant. Fafner made a deal with Wotan to build Valhalla. And in the end of that first opera, Fafner, having killed his own brother, walks away with the ring and the gold and the Tarnhelm, these magical elements which came out of the Rheingold. Albrecht, of course, wants it back. Mime wants it too. So they're all plotting. Our ego is not one. Our ego is not an individual. It is not consistent. It is not organized. Our ego is a multiplicity. A seething, chaotic sea of desire. In conflict with itself. Mimi and Aldrich symbolized in this story, plot against each other. Fafner and Fasselt, in the first opera, fought to the death because of greed, because of gluttony, because of lust. These three traitors exist on our own psyche. These are the same three traitors of Moses, the same three traitors of Osiris, the same three traitors of Hiram Abif. All of these initiatic stories contain three traitors. Even the Buddha faced the three daughters of Mara, the three furies from the Greek mysteries. The initiate who enters into the direct path must conquer them. And to conquer the three furies, the three traitors, requires in-depth self-knowledge. Because those three were created by none other than ourselves. They are our own psyche. Pilate is the demon of the mind. The intellect. That demonic intelligence that utilizes our intellect for its own purposes. The intellect in itself is just a machine. It's just a tool. Which, when it's placed into the hands of God, becomes very useful. But when controlled by the demon of the mind... It is a demon. It is a traitor. And it works against the Christ in the same way that Mime and Albrecht and Fafner are doing. Caiaphas is related to the demon of evil will. Caiaphas acts like your best friend. He acts very sincere. He acts as if he's very concerned for your welfare. Like Mime is doing. Mime is always telling Siegfried, everything I do is for you. I raised you. I fed you. I protected you. I've taught you. I love you. You're my son. All the while... Mime is plotting to kill him. Judas is the demon of desire. The one who sells his master. The one who's driven by instinct. Now, in the story of Wagner, the way he's developed the ring, we can see 
that these three traitors fight amongst themselves in order to conquer and control the Rheingold, to take possession of the ring so they'll have power over the world. And they all plot against each other. And they all plot against the gods. And they all think they are clever enough to outwit everyone else. And we do the same thing. This is particularly important when we're working with the tools of scientific chastity. When we have some development. Because in our hands is a power which the ego wants to take for itself. And that's what's represented in this stage of the opera. Siegfried has that sword. The only weapon that can conquer the dragon and take from the dragon the ring and the gold and the Tarnhelm. Mime wants it. Albrecht wants it. Wotan shows up to taunt them. It's interesting. In the first stages of the operas, Wotan is very concerned with the outcome of what's going to happen. He's frustrated. And he's always seeking to find a way to change the situation. But by this point of the opera, he's become more like Loge. More coming involved in a scene and teasing and then extracting himself. Not taking any real direct action. And the reason is, Wotan, the father, wants his son, his spiritual son, his human soul, to be strong. To develop his will. To not be weak. But to act when necessary. In the right way. And to know how to do it. This is why Wotan is around, is observing, is always watching, but never interferes. He never tells Siegfried what to do. He never tells him what to do. Meditate on that. Siegfried has to do what he thinks is right. He has to act, but on his own. Wotan doesn't want to develop a weak soul. A soul that's always lost, without direction, without strength. Wotan needs a warrior. Wotan needs Siegfried to have his own power. Now, of course, in this scene, when Siegfried and Mime arrive, Albrecht hides himself. And Siegfried hears a bird singing and wishes he could understand the bird. In all the different esoteric traditions, the bird always plays a significant role as a symbol. We have the Kalahamsa swan of Hinduism, the phoenix bird, the Guryan. We have the vehicle of uh, Rama. Many birds appear, some symbolizing negative elements and some symbolizing positive elements. In Christianity, we have the dove who symbolizes the Holy Spirit, Bina. Bina, of course, in, in Hebrew, means intelligence or understanding and is related to Shiva of Hinduism, that creative and destructive power. The bird that appears here sings a song 
that Siegfried longs to understand but cannot. And that's because his own development is not to that point yet where he has deep comprehension of this level of Bina. So he crafts for himself a flute made out of a reed and tries to play. This is, of course, related to the magic flute of Mozart, the flute of Krishna. Where's the This flute represents, of course, the spinal column with its seven notes, the seven churches, the seven chakras, which the initiate plays, uses that energy of the Holy Spirit, the bird, trying to imitate that force and utilize it through the spinal column, through the chakras, through the powers of the seven churches. But he's unable to do it because his own development is not advanced enough to do it, because he hasn't killed the dragon yet. In other words, Siegfried needs to know more, needs to develop, needs to understand more. So he tosses aside that reed, that flute, and takes his hunting horn The hunting horn, or the trumpet, is uh, also a symbol you find in many religions. In the Torah, it says that you should take your trumpet in order to awaken from your sleep and remember God. And that trumpet symbolizes the sexual force, the phallus. It's the, how the note is played through that, related to the throat, through the sexual transmutation, through mantra, through the logos, the word, sound, played through that, through the throat, is how God creates. In other words, this is a symbol of learning how to take those forces in other levels, superior levels, and transform them, transmute them into music, into the warrior's call. So he begins to blow his trumpet, his hunting horn. In other words, he's transmuting energy. He's directing forces. When he does that, who appears? Who's called from the depths? but his own Leviathan, the dragon, Fafner. And they have to fight. In other words, when we use the sexual energy, the dragon is stimulated. So we need the sword to conquer it. Siegfried kills the dragon because he's not afraid the Christ does not have fear. And the human soul is that warrior inspired with the Christic force who is able to conquer that dragon and slay Fafner. He does so by inserting his sword into the dragon's heart. Now the sword is a symbol of will, of transmuted forces, the flaming sword. And when we insert that sword into the heart of the dragon, we penetrate and comprehend the nature of desire. We acquire through the nothing, through the emptiness of meditation, the heart of suffering, of how our own dragon hoards the gold of the Rhine the powers of the Holy Spirit that are placed in the waters. So through meditation, through utilizing the sword of the discriminative awareness, we penetrate the heart of Fafner and kill our own demon of desire, Judas, 
the dragon that lies within us. And what comes from that is blood. And when Siegfried, with the blood burning his hands, touches it to his mouth, suddenly he can understand the bird, the singing bird. He can hear words now. And this is because there's a direct relationship between the sexual forces present in Shiva Shakti, Bina, the Holy Spirit, and the dragon, who is the opposite. The blood is the energy, the pure force of the sexual energy, which, of course, is in our own blood. Do you know the profound relationship between blood and the sexual waters? Have you studied your own anatomy? When Siegfried kills the dragon, touches the blood to his lips, he's taking that sexual energy into his throat. That, the tree of knowledge. And that gives him the capacity to understand the language of the Holy Spirit. The language of the Logos, the word. The sound of creation. Now, of course, Siegfried grabs the Tarnhelm and the ring. Mime and Albrecht fight because they want to control Siegfried. Albrecht leaves. And Mime is left to offer his poisoned drink to Siegfried. And what else is a poisoned drink but the same poisoned apple of Snow White? That fruit of the tree of knowledge that sacred force which the ego uses to tempt us, to tantalize us. Drink of this and you will have knowledge. Drink of this and you will have power. Drink of this to refresh yourself. But Siegfried knows that his ego is always trying to deceive him. So he knows not to take the sexual force lightly, not to misuse it, not to abuse it, not to feed his own desire. So instead, he kills Mime. He slays him. And then, the bird gives him a present. See, now Siegfried has conquered two of the three traitors. And each time he performs one of these great works, he receives a gift. He receives something in return. Knowledge. First, he receives knowledge of the understanding of the language of the birds. To understand Bina. And second, he is given the knowledge of Brunhild. Brunhilda. The bird tells him that on a remote rock awaits Brunhilda. And only someone who has no fear can conquer her, can take her as his own. So, of course, Siegfried wants to test himself and to acquire this maiden, and he rushes off. Now, what we have to point out here is that at this scene, this stage of the opera, we've moved from the first mountain into the second mountain. And the second and third mountains have never been publicly revealed before the last century. So you won't find much, if anything, about them anywhere. Unless you look into the Greek mysteries and you'll find the symbol of the 12 labors of Hercules. And those 12 labors are these two mountains. You'll also find those mountains represented in the life of Jesus. But again, it's symbolic. The second mountain is a process whereby the walker of the direct path 
descends into an inferior world in the klipoth in order to conquer parts of his ego. And when he does that, that portion of hell in his own mind is cleaned. And when that cleansing occurs, not only has that initiate conquered that level of his own abyss, but he receives in turn that level of heaven. With each succeeding level, the initiate awakens more consciousness. These are not initiations. Initiations only happen in the first mountain. The whole second mountain is the work of an initiation related to Bina. This process of descending and ascending is symbolized in many religions once again. When Jesus descends into hell, when Orpheus descends into hell, when the Greek heroes, the Nordic heroes. But right at the beginning of the second mountain, having performed these first works of the second mountain, the initiate is going to receive a long-awaited goal, which is union with Brunhilde, which is what we're going to talk about when we hear the description of the third act. Act 3. The wanderer appears on the path to Brunhilde's rock and summons Erda the earth goddess. Erda, appearing confused, is unable to offer any advice. Wotan informs her that he no longer fears the end of the gods. Indeed, it is his desire. His heritage will be left to Siegfried, the Walsung, and their child, Brunhilde, will work the deed that redeems the world. Dismissed, Erda, Erda sinks back into the earth. Siegfried arrives, and the wanderer questions the youth. Siegfried, who does not recognize his grandfather, answers insolently and starts down the path towards Brunhilde's rock. The wanderer blocks his path, but Siegfried breaks Wotan's spear with a blow from nothing. Wotan calmly gathers up the pieces and vanishes. Siegfried enters the ring of fire emerging on Brunhilde's rock. At first, he thinks the armored figure is a man. However, when he removes the armor, he finds a woman beneath. Uncertain about what to do, Siegfried at last experiences fear. In desperation, he kisses Brunhilde, waking her from her magic sleep. Hesitant at first, Brunhilde is won over by Siegfried's love and renounces the world of the gods. Together they hail light-bringing love and laughing death. Siegfried follows the guidance of the bird. And the bird naturally is the Holy Spirit who's providing the guidance to lead Siegfried up the mountain to find that remote rock where Brunhilde sleeps. That rock, of course, is the second mountain. But to enter into that work, one has to pass ordeals. One is tested. With each succeeding level of development of the consciousness. The initiate has to prove that they have the capacity to receive it. Just in the same way that you wouldn't give your child the keys to the car or some other powerful tool until that child proved that they were mature enough to handle it, so too does God test us to only give us access to those things that we can use responsibly.
Siegfried follows this bird up the rocky path and arrives at a clearing. And there he discovers Wotan. But he doesn't know who Wotan is. Now, unfortunately, I skipped part of the the act. (laughs) Let me go back a little bit so I can explain about Erda. When this act opens, Wotan is going to speak with Erda, who is, of course, the goddess of the earth. She sleeps. When we understand Kabbalistic symbolism, we understand that God, or the being, is a diverse collection of parts, is a multiplicity of aspects, is like a diamond with many faces. And the purpose of liberation is to unify all those parts and to have absolute consciousness of all of them collected. So in this scene, really what we're representing, what we're, what we're observing, are two parts of our own being, Wotan and Erda. Wotan being Keter, our owner father, the wanderer. Erda being the divine mother. But she sleeps. She has wisdom, but she does not have everything. She needs more, too. And Wotan arrives there to get information, to find out if she knows what will happen, to find out what can be done. And what's curious about this scene is neither one of them knows. Neither one of them really can predict with perfection what will happen. And this is because our own God, our own being, still has not acquired perfect knowledge. Because we have fallen. We're part of him. While we are in darkness, so is he. While we are in imperfection, so is he. While the human soul is still imperfect, God still is not fully perfect. In other words, there are levels of development even amongst the gods. The ultimate level of the development of the gods is called objective reasoning. It's a form of knowledge that's far beyond what we can comprehend with our little puny mind. With all the levels, the heavens that are acquired in the process of initiation... Each time the initiate conquers a new level, he's conquering more and more comprehension, more and more understanding. In fact, the totality of walking this path of the three mountains is a process of acquiring knowledge from the very bottom of the tree to the very top, to acquire knowledge of all the levels of existence. And the sum total of that wisdom, that understanding, is given to God is what develops the abilities of God, the understanding of God, the glory and majesty of God. It is not for our glory. It is not for our own benefit. It is for the benefit of the divine. You look into the life of Jesus and you see he did what he did not for himself. He did what he did for humanity and for God taking nothing for himself, not even glory. And that's the path of the bodhisattva. All the glory goes to God, to Wotan. So in this scene, we see this curious uncertainty among the gods. And that uncertainty is there because God has placed in us free will. And God respects that. 
God is not a tyrant. The, the universe has manifested itself according to a certain design. And as you descend through the tree of life, you see more and more laws and things become more and more complicated the further down you go. And into the midst of that, God places his eye, his consciousness, which has to develop itself and acquire knowledge all the way up the tree. And in each level, working upwards, the initiate has to develop more and more maturity, spiritual maturity, conscious maturity. This is the nature of real willpower, to know how to act in the right way at the right time. This has nothing to do with moral codes. There is no golden rule because at one moment what is right and the next moment will be wrong. And the only one who can know the difference is the one who listens to the voice of the silence inside. Siegfried is performing that work. And when he arrives at that rock, he finds Wotan blocking his way. And what does Wotan call himself? The guardian of the rock. And he is that. The rock is the foundation stone, which Jesus mentioned many times. The rock upon which you have to build your church to build the temple. But it is that rock that the builders reject. In other words, the Nirvanis, the Pratyekas, the Nibelung, all reject the full development of that rock because of attachment. This is the same rock that in the wilderness Moses strikes with his staff and water comes out. That's the sexual water which comes from our own rock, the foundation stone, Yasod. This is related with the lunar works of the second mountain. We begin the second mountain working through the progressive nine heavens, which are naturally related to the nine muses who accompany Apollo, which are, of course, symbolized by the nine Valkyrie, which Odin created. And the first Valkyrie is Brunhilde, who sleeps on this rock. This is the rock of Yasod, but in heaven. Superior aspect. So Siegfried has to pass the ordeal to gain entrance into that level of development. And to do so, he has to confront Wotan. But he doesn't know who Wotan is. In other words, Siegfried does not yet know his own self, his own inner father, his own Keter. But he has courage. He has willpower to proceed. Wotan blocks his way with his staff. and says, you cannot advance. You have to go through me first. So we would say symbolically that Wotan is appearing here as Loge, as Lucifer, as the tempter, as the guardian of the threshold. This apparition, which we have to have courage to confront and overcome. So Siegfried swings his sword and breaks the staff of Wotan. And what else is that? You'll remember, of course, that in the previous opera, Wotan broke the sword. And now the same sword reforged breaks the staff. And what has happened? What has changed? 
In the previous opera, that sword was the sword of a walker on the first mountain who only had a certain level of development, who was still bound by certain laws, certain commandments, certain ways of understanding, certain ways of behaving. But through great works and development of consciousness, Siegfried has arrived on to the precipice, the entrance into the second mountain. In other words, he has more understanding. He needs to develop his will in a greater degree. And he's able to break the staff of Wotan. This is a very deep symbol. The staff represents, naturally, the spine. But the staff, in particular, is Wotan's symbol of his contracts, of his rules, of his laws. Do you see where I'm going? What's interesting is that when someone is in the very beginning stages of initiation, this person is bound by the Ten Commandments, by certain rules, by certain contracts that we make with God. We're bound by that. And this is what Moses delivers to the people. Basic rules that one must follow in order to reach a certain stage of initiation. But to go beyond, to go into further levels of development, one has to transcend even that. Now, you'll remember that those Ten Commandments are given in Deuteronomy. Do you know that Deutero means second In other words, the Ten Commandments are the second law. They are the law given to the beginners. But there is a first law. And that is, you shall love your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. In other words, you shall do the will of your God above all things. The walker of the direct path transcends the Ten Commandments and begins to act in a revolutionary way in accordance with his own will. But that is the will of God in him. By appearances, it looks contradictory. It appears to that he's breaking the law. And Jesus naturally ran into this all the time with all the Pharisees accusing him, you're breaking the law, you're breaking the law, you're breaking the law. And what does he say? I am the law. The Christ is the law, which transcends the second law. Siegfried represents the Christified initiate who breaks his contractual obligations with lower laws. He's revolutionary. He's beyond the law. He's becoming Christ to incarnate that. And this is how we can understand when we look into many initiatic stories, stories of the lives of great initiates, they appear to do things which contradict those Ten Commandments or the basic precepts. They appear to do things that are against what we call moral. And that's because they answer to a higher law. Of course, Wotan withdraws and Siegfried ascends up the mountain. And he finds there a sleeping warrior. This naturally calls to mind many famous stories in Western tradition, such as Sleeping Beauty or Snow White. Um similar such stories where we find the maiden sleeps and the warrior has to come to awaken her. But there's a beautiful additional factor here that Siegfried sings, I must awaken the maid to waken myself. If you watch the opera, you'll hear him say that. 
So that is a very direct indication of what this opera is about. Siegfried, naturally, is representing the human soul, the warrior, the fighter, Lancelot. And who he finds there on the rock is Brunhild, who's one of the Valkyrie that Wotan created. Brunhilda is related to Gebra, the Sephira Gebra on the Tree of Life. In Sanskrit, she would be called Budi. She is the divine soul or the spiritual soul, the feminine soul, the complement of the human soul. In other words, Wotan has two souls, one divine, one human, one feminine, one masculine. They are part of him, but he needs them to unite so that he can advance, so that he can grow. Gebra, or Brunhilde, is also called Guinevere in Arthurian mysteries. She's also called Helen in the Greek mysteries. She's called Beatrice by Goethe, by other writers. This is a universal symbol. When, he, uh, when Siegfried arrives there, he finds this warrior. He doesn't realize it's a woman, so he begins to remove her armor. He then realizes this is a woman and becomes afraid. Personally, this is my favorite moment in the whole opera. And it, it's because it represents and demonstrates the humanity of Christ. The tenderness. The beauty. That Christ loves. This is not a cold love. It's not an indifferent love or a distant love. It's very personal. It's very emotional. It's very real. Siegfried, the human soul, perceiving his divine soul, experiences a kind of vulnerability. For the first time, his courage is challenged. The initiate who works in this practical science will discover this directly for themselves by working with alchemy. Because any person who's working with alchemy knows well, no matter how courageous you are, when you enter into intimate union with your spouse, you are vulnerable as a mind, as a heart, and sexually. Your spouse will know you in ways that you don't even know yourself. Your spouse will see things in you that you've never shown to anyone and don't want to show. And that is a kind of fear. Not fear in the sense of the way we tend to think of fear, but fear in a, in a kind of emotional vulnerability and respect. This is a quality of love that only someone who's really experienced love can understand. It's not fear in the way we usually think of it. It's an aspect of love which is beautiful, but which has a profound emotional vulnerability. Siegfried discovers fear in this moment. He discovers what it means to to have weakness. Not an egotistical weakness but to have that emotional uh, vulnerability. So he decides to awaken her, and he kisses her. This is the entrance into the ninth sphere, when the man and woman unite, when masculine and feminine forces cross and form that famous cross, The feminine being horizontal, lying asleep on the rock. The masculine being vertical, penetrates that and forms a cross. 
And this is the mystical union. In terms of the initiatic symbol, this represents the moment in which the consciousness of the initiate is betrothed to the divine soul. In other words, Tifereth and Geburah unite. And this is a moment of incredible beauty for the initiate, but also provides the necessary elements for that initiate to advance, to grow, to learn. Of course, in the opera, they sing a very beautiful um, duet proclaiming the mysteries of love. And both of them sense and feel that vulnerability of that relationship. But by uniting with each other, by trusting in that love and trusting each other, they have the courage to renounce everything, to embrace death. So the end of this opera, they sing of that. That even though what they do from love will doom the gods, will cause the destruction of everything, they do it because of love. And the nature of that symbol will be explained in next week's lecture. Do you have any questions? So, practically that the incarnation of Puri. Right. It's, it's pointed out that this is the moment when the when Bodhi incarnates into the initiate physically. And Bodhi, of course, in Sanskrit means intellect. But this is not intellect in the way we think of it. This is a, a capacity or a, a vessel through which we can receive understanding. Bodhi is our divine consciousness which is receptive. Receptive in the way that a vessel is receptive. And what that vessel receives is the wisdom of God, the wisdom of prana, the wisdom of atman, the wisdom of wotan. That wisdom, that light, expresses itself through buddhi, through gebra. So when we learn to meditate, truly meditate, not just concentration, not just mantras, but to enter into dharana, dhyana, samadhi, to go into levels of perception where we perceive directly without the interference of the ego. What we learn is how to receive through buddhi, to connect in those brief moments with buddhi, to receive that understanding. But in this moment of initiation is when that element of our psyche incarnates, becomes fully active continually in the consciousness of the initiate. So that's a tremendous step. In a, in a sort of synthetic way, we could say that that gives the capacity to access samadhi continually. Buddhi is that. That's interesting. So it's pointed out that this is what Krishna calls the reincarnation of the gods, a true reincarnation. And this is because it's the divine soul that provides that direct knowledge and provides that direct knowledge to the human soul who can then act on it. Yes? It was mentioned that when traveling in the sixth dimension, one has no ego. Can you explain about Kaifas, the demon of evil will, if when experiencing the world of will, one has no ego? Well, Caiaphas does not belong in the sixth dimension. He belongs in the inferior part of the fifth dimension. So, in other words, our will 
which should be in Tiferet, becomes trapped in the ego, which is in the klipot. Our own will is trapped in hell. That's Caiaphas. We have to renounce that, extract our consciousness from that, and then we can experience real will, free will, which is not conditioned by desire, not conditioned by pride or by envy, but is instead that free, active will of Tiferet in the sixth dimension. But you can only experience that if the consciousness is fully separated from the ego. Do you have another question? How is it that only Albrecht recognizes the wanderer as Wotan? That's an interesting question. Well, actually, Mime recognizes him for who he is, and Fafner does too. The three traitors know very well the difference between them and God. But they do their best to keep us in the dark. It's like Mime knows all along who Siegfried is, but he doesn't tell him until Siegfried forces him to. And how does he do that but through meditation? So the ego, you know, again, the ego is a multiplicity. The ego is very complicated. There are many parts of it. Some are more clever than others. We have what we call um, the Pharisee eye or the mystical eye which is a very spiritual kind of ego. And this, na- this aspect of the psyche can know these teachings very well, can understand them in its way, can teach, can talk about Gnosis, can talk about religion, can talk about God, but is not God. Thinks it is. And many of those so-called masters or leaders of movements, really is just an enthroned Pharisee eye. An ego that's attached to being a leader, attached to being admired, to being worshipped, to being followed. And that ego in its depth knows, but it's fooling the consciousness of the person. So even the person believes that. The, the, a little deeper into that question, though, is to consider why it is that at this point of the opera, two of those three traitors are dead. Why is Albrecht left? What is it about Albrecht? And we're going to find that out next week in the next lecture. Any other questions? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. The question is about the, the swords and weapons that the ego makes. And do they get stronger when they're reforged? The symbolism there is how our own ego develops tools. And in, in certain levels, we need that. So, for example, when we enter into Gnosis, we have a lot of ego. When we enter into any kind of religion. But we need that religion. We need that structure. We need those tools in order for us to um, have some degree of, of uh, ability to advance or to deepen our understanding. So we learn certain practices, for example. Meditation, concentration, or mantras. But really, those tools are weak because the ego has created them. So we could say, maybe we inherited a religion from our family or from our country. Maybe we inherited a teaching that some person made up or invented. So there might be a certain very limited usefulness of that tool. But when it's really used in a strong way, it shatters, which shows that it has no real strength. And this is true of many mystical traditions nowadays. When you really apply analysis to them, 
when you really look into the depth, when you really try to utilize them in a practical way to advance your own self-knowledge, the tools become useless because they're not strong enough to conquer the mind. The mind made them. It may be the case that some of us find a school like that, a religion or a teaching, and we practice it, but it breaks on us. We find that it has no real strength. So we leave. We go and find another school, another teaching, and we start to use that. Same thing happens. Those tools keep breaking. The same thing can happen here. You can acquire the kind of knowledge that we're discussing, but take it only with your ego and become a very egotistical student, not taking it into the consciousness and develop yourself as a Pharisee, as someone who believes, as someone who agrees. But in the end, because you've not developed those tools consciously, they will break. And so you see many students who come to teachings like this and leave because they didn't grasp the real use of that force. Yes? In the case of those uh, who teach lashing, lashing yourself because they take the, the teaching in the wrong way. Right. And so a good example of that is there are many groups that take these teachings in the wrong way. They take it through, we would say, recurrent karmic elements of the psyche. And they translate the teaching according to those elements of their own psyche. An example of that, there's a certain group who uses these teachings of Gnosis, but in the wrong way, because of recurrent elements, things that have happened in the past that live inside their mind in the depths. So they take this teaching, and instead of learning how to meditate and conquer the ego that way, they take a whip physically and whip themselves, which is wrong. There are schools that used to do that in past ages, and it was wrong then. And they're doing it now by matter of recurrence, by matter of repetition, and by misunderstanding the teaching. And this is true in many other ways, how we can take elements of the ego, which we may not even see, but the things that we did in past lives, which caused us to have a predisposition in our understanding. So when we hear Gnosis, we think, oh yeah, it turns on a light bulb in the ego. And then we combine those two and we make a tool that's actually useless or harmful. Any other questions? You had a question? It's about the, the blood of the dragon. Yeah. Um, you said that a Sikh could have blood in his hand. Mm-hmm. In his hands, the, the blood burned, but not in his mouth. Right. The blood of the dragon is the very um, pure and root sexual force, which we know is flowing through Yasad. These are the rivers of Eden. When those rivers flow downwards into hell, they become conditioned by that environment. And so they become the rivers of Hades, Atron, Plegithon, the Styx, etc., that energy has a lot of potency and a lot of power. When Siegfried kills the dragon with his sword, he gets blood on his hands and it burns him. And this is the nature of how the work in alchemy and transmutation can be painful. The hands is how we work. We work with our hands. It's symbolic. So in the nature of working on himself to conquer the dragon, it's painful. It burns. And this is true of any ego you work on. It hurts. When you really see your own filthiness and you really see how filthy and disgusting your own mind is, that's painful. So it burns the hands. But in this opera, it symbolized that he takes and touches the blood into his mouth. And this is a symbol of comprehension in meditation. When you take something in your mouth, you're going to consume and digest that, right? And you're going to take it into the throat. But that process of transforming is on multiple levels. Firstly, it's happening because the energy is being transformed up the spinal column. You see the raising of the hand to the mouth, right? 
symbolizing the energy moving up, over, and through dot, through the mouth. And that's what provides the wisdom, the understanding. So that's transmutation and meditation provide that comprehension. And that's what gives him the power. There's still pain. And this is true of any ego in any level. The way to conquer it, you have to learn what real tantra means. To take energy and transform it. Sometimes it's painful. Most of the time it's painful. But the pain is far less than remaining a Nibelung. Than remaining as a dweller of the underworld, consumed by envy. That's pain. Any other questions? Yes. Mime? Mm-hmm. Um, he kind of like tricks her into feeding the dragon, so like Yeah, I know the part you're talking about. Uh, I just, I'm kind of just, just not really sure what, what's really happening there. Like he's, is he kind of helping the initiate when he sees it because he's a far? Like it's very symbolic, of course, but I mean, is that his way of helping? My understanding of that scene, when Wotan comes to Mime and asks him questions, they have this test with each other. My understanding of that is is it represents how the being helps us, but not in direct ways. God is always there behind everything that's going on with us. But you notice in that scene that Siegfried is not there. He's not around. And Siegfried is acting repeatedly, but God isn't there to help him directly. And to me, again, this represents the, the need for Wotan to help his initiate develop, but not directly. So I could relate that, for example. So many students want God to come down out of the clouds and say, okay, now you go do this and that because I told you so. But God doesn't do that. Instead, behind the scenes, he works out a few little things. So then we walk into situations that we have to solve. And really that's the work of Loge, Lucifer, or the trainer, who in Job is doing exactly that, the book of Job, the way he manipulates situations to test him. So that's my understanding of it. In a way, you can see that Wotan could easily kill the ego at any time. Yeah, I just found it interesting that he kind of just sets it up. Like he makes sure he's not there. Yeah. Kind of gets Wotan himself could go and kill any of these elements on his own. He could kill Fafner, Mime, or Albrecht. Easy. But he doesn't. Because if he did that, Siegfried would not grow. He would not learn. He would not develop. And in the end, Wotan would gain nothing. He'd be in the same situation. Any other questions? Okay. I hope you'll join us for the conclusion of this series next week, which I expect will be um, far more dramatic and, and elevated than what we've experienced so far. So I encourage you, if you have the chance, to watch the opera before the lecture, as your own understanding of it will be much deeper. Thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. 
thank you. May all beings be happy. Good morning, good morning.